Hey everyone, the American Homebrewers Association has teamed up with White Labs to offer free pure pitch yeast to all new and renewing members during the month of October. We all love yeast, right? And free yeast is even better. So head over to homebrewersassociation.org before October 31st to claim your free gift. That's homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 22nd, 2015. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, home brewer Phil Proctor talks about the ins and outs of installing an elaborate tap system and what to consider when setting up your own beer dispensing system. Also, Phil talks about his homemade glycol chiller. If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you can get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. We also have a Basic Brewing radio and Basic Brewing video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on the Google Plus as well. And thanks to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us first. Go to our website, click on our banner on the right-hand side of basicbrewing.com. That'll take you back to Amazon, where you can shop to your heart's content. You won't know any difference. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you the show, and we greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're in the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're in the Stitcher app as well. And if you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our virtual guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support, and thanks to everybody who's done so already. Steve and I shot an episode of a Basic Brewing video a few days ago featuring my uh, sort of accidental Oktoberfest that's the Oktoberfest that I brewed that had a strangely high finishing gravity. Uh, I think we figured out what's going on. So check out that episode, which will be posted later this week. The beer was served uh, at the event I brewed it for on Saturday, and people loved it, by the way. So all turned out well, and uh, people had a, uh, a low-gravity alternative. Uh, Good news on the uh, local beer front here in northwest Arkansas. The cream ale, based on my recipe, is now on tap at Apple Blossom Brewing Company in Fayetteville. And right now, it's on nitro. So the uh, cream ale is truly creamy. Uh, And it's very, very good. I I also get a keg to uh, serve for the aforementioned event uh, alongside the Oktoberfest. And boy, uh, the cream ale also went over very well with uh, participants. Uh, and I have a show lined up to talk about uh, kind of the behind the scenes of how that beer was brewed uh, and uh, how the brew day went and such as that. Uh, so look for that as well coming up on this program soon. The uh, Apple Blossom crew did a great job, and I appreciate them uh, asking me to participate. Let's take a look into the mailbag. Chris Cambrus from Bascule Brewery and Public House in Lorraine, Ohio, writes in with this. Uh, Chris says, I thought I should share a helpful tip on how to fix bitter astringent flavor. Chris says, I recently made a smoked walnut porter wherein a rather careless move I added crushed walnuts, shells and all, into my mash. The flavor was great but overshadowed by a harsh, bitter, tongue-curdling aftertaste caused by the astringent tannins in the skins of the nut. Sugar was no help as I tried to rescue the beer with maple syrup. After researching the word bitter, I found that it's caused by high alkalinity, so I thought the logical step was to neutralize it with acidity. Chris says, I simmered a slurry of dried tart plums and strained out the solids, then added to my beer, and it worked. The beer was undrinkable before the addition of the dried plums, and now it is a smooth, complex, and flavorful porter. A happy ending. Uh, Chris says, by the, way, by the way, this beer along with my Harvest Fig and a Steam Beer will be my brewery's debut beers at a fundraiser for the Port Authority of Lorraine, Ohio. Wish me luck. Well, I did. Good luck, Chris, again. Uh, 
So there you go. I appreciate the tip. If you have an astringent beer, try some tart plum juice. Sounds like a tasty idea. And and good for digestion, I would assume. Steve would Steve Steve might call it a hurry up. The uh, <laughs> the weather is getting uh, is getting to be really nice outside, and that just puts me in the mood to brew. And if you're in the mood to brew, you might want to check out the uh, build your own beer feature of HighGravityBrew.com, the brainchild of Desiree and Dave of our sponsor High Gravity in Tulsa. Build your own beer lets you select all your ingredients from one page including adjuncts, yeast, priming options, flute, uh, fruit flavorings, not flute flavorings, but fruit flavorings, and purees. You can even name your beer, and you can easily reorder ingredients from your account management page. So if you have a beer that you brew on a regular basis, that makes, it makes your life a bit easier, I would say. High Gravity offers $7.99 flat rate shipping on most items, and if you're new to brewing, High Gravity has a build-your-own starter kit that lets you add on to the basic kit all on one page. And while you're there, of course, you can check out all the electric brewing system options, too. Check it all out at highgravitybrew.com, and we appreciate Desiree and Dave's continued support. Okay, I get questions every now and then through the email about beer dispensing systems. Usually it's, uh, my beer is foamy. What do I do? So, uh... There are a few variables to think about, and I asked uh, Phil Proctor, who is an engineer, to help us out with those. And Phil has uh, engineered his own glycol chilling system with everyday components to keep the beer in the lines cool and to save a few bucks in the process. Phil Proctor, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, thank you, James. It's a pleasure to, to be on your show. It's nice to talk to someone every now and then who doesn't have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we think around here. <laughs> Being from Arkansas, I got rid of mine uh, for <laughs> professional reasons. But uh, you are uh, a uh, – you email me to talk about uh, setting up a beer dispensing system, and you have set up a, a sort of a, a more elaborate uh, than usual, I would assume, beer dispensing system. But let's first of all, let's talk about you and your background, not only in home brewing, but but what might make you an, an, an expert in this area. Well, I, I got into home brewing uh, years ago. I was um, always a beer fan um, coming along, and then it was uh, back in. I guess it was about it was yeah it was 1986 is when uh, went out to went, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting side story. I went out to Fort Sill for uh, my our, uh, my field artillery officer basic course right out of college. I went to Georgia Tech, and you know that's the first time I had any you know decent spending money. And the thing I learned about the about the military bases is there's a there was you know back then certainly a strong connection to Germany and other parts of Europe, and they had the best selection of uh, foreign beers. You know, back back then, if you wanted a, a European beer out of the store, it was going to be either Heineken or Lowenbrau or St. Pauli's Girl. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there was that strong connection. So they, they tended to have some, you know, some German beers in particular that you, you couldn't find anywhere else. So that got me into, you know, different styles of beer and so forth. Well, then fast forward a couple of years from then, and my wife and I take off on a trip to Europe, two and a half weeks. And uh, we went, spent a week in England and the rest on, on the mainland, um, including Germany. And what really surprised me after that was experiencing the English beers, Uh particularly the bitters and never had them before. You know, like my daughter says nowadays, they're, you know, warm and not carbonated. <laughs> uh, but uh, the great thing about that trip was going from town to town and going to the local pubs and each pub would have, you know, it's totally uncommon for, for us in the States then, but each pub would have their local beer. Um, and we would sample those and, you know, move on to another place, and then the next town have a different style uh, on tap. And 
you know, we're we're almost there now in the U.S., but this is, you know, 1988. So at that point, you know, I come back and I'm trying to find that point. I was living in Atlanta and a little more selection there. And I was looking around trying to find some of these types of beers and just couldn't do it. Uh, just, of course, they just weren't carried. Some might be a little close and some might be a little more exotic. So, you know, that's what put me into home brewing. And so I started home brewing um, uh, when a friend mentioned it to me and started in 1992. And along the way since then, you know, I started basically stovetop with extracts like most others back then. That's, that's about what it was. Um, but, uh, along the way have progressed, you know, differing levels, but I'll say that there are, th- there were three milestones along that. Cause that's been what, 23 years, um, that stepped up my ability to brew. And first of all, was when I got a kegerator probably eight or 10 years ago, because, that kegerator with the kegs alleviated me of that burden of thinking about bottling. You know, <laughs> you know if, if you, if you want to go brew, you're like, well, I really want to brew, but do I really want to brew? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, because of the, the, the headache of cleaning and uh, dispensing and bottling and packaging and all that. So the kegerator allowed me to you know, free me up to do more, you know, with less burden. So I got, and every time you brew, you get, you get better at it, of course. So, um, so that helped me a lot there. Uh, the, the second thing along the way was, was just about four or five years ago where, uh, I, I found out about the local brew club and joined it and quickly realized there were guys that had been brewing just a couple of years that had just accelerated and moved you know, beyond me. And they were brewing some outstanding beers. I mean, just it was really great. So that gave me encouragement. And uh, at that point, moved to all grain. I had been, and along the way, I'd moved to mini mash, been doing mini mash along the way a lot too. But uh, moved up to all grain. And, you know, I said, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. So um, with that, you know, that has helped uh, allow to pick up the quality a lot better. And the third thing I can attribute to you and, and other podcasters is that really for the last year or so is just getting hooked on these podcasts mm-hmm. to the point where, you know, particularly in yours, because you're approaching, what, maybe 500 by now? Yeah, it's getting up there, 460 or 70 yeah. some odd. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you started out with, you know, the basic ones to help people get going, but what's great about it. And and I want to thank you for what you do because it, it, is, a, it is a definite service for all of us out here uh, to have the luxury of being able, particularly you've been doing it so long that you can now go to some specialized topics and just pick them, <laughs> you know. And I, I, there's there's several that I've listened to twice because they were uh, they were they were so good. Well, it's all, it's all thanks to, to, to people like you who actually know stuff that I can talk to and sound like I know stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. And then well, after the conversation, we all know uh, a little bit more or, or sometimes a lot more than what we started out with. But you've got a, you've got a technical background that kind of uh, gives you sort of an advantage in doing things like designing beer dispensing systems. Talk about that. Well, I'm an engineer, uh, and I've been exposed to a lot of aspects of uh, engineering. And so, the, you know, the principles of that, particularly what we're going to talk about today, is uh, very useful in that. Because, you know, when you get into it the first time, even for me, you you still got to absorb, you know, what's going on with this, uh, the mechanics of it. And then it kind of falls right in, and you understand it and can apply the the math to it if you need to, to make it work. And we're going to talk about a little bit of math. <laughs> Warning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trigger yeah, alert. Disclaimer, get the calculator out. <laughs> so talk about your system. What what uh, what have you got going on? Well, I gave you the background um, of where I came from. So I've, I've been doing it for a while. And, you know, it's been a slow progression, you know, over a longer period of time than a lot of people. But uh, I happened to have the opportunity at my wife's encouragement 
to engage on a home project. And uh, it was, uh, we talked about it for a couple of years, but she went, what led to it is she wanted to put in a pool in the backyard and said, if we do a pool, we've got to do a pool house. And I said, well, if we're going to do a pool house, I'd really like to have a basement. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I don't have a basement. I haven't had one. I was like, I really want a basement. And so anyway, I, I designed it such that uh, we would have a basement under it that I could put all of my cool stuff in and, uh, and, and do it with a brewing purpose in mind. So I had kind of a blank canvas with this, so to speak. So um, we designed it such that, and I'll try to paint a mental picture because we're going to talk about uh, – the system I have in relation to what I, in relation to my my project, how we designed it, um, we extended a building off of the rear of the house, um, off of the sunroom, straight out the back, and it is, uh, I believe, about twelve feet wide by twenty six long, and as I said, underneath it is is a basement. And but it's in two sections. So next to the house is open air, and then on the end is the enclosed part with the bathroom and kitchenette and so forth. And there are stairs there to go down into the basement. Um, but we uh, decided in that open air part we would put a bar for outdoor entertainment. And here here I am in Augusta. We we do a lot of us do masters rentals. So that's another feature that kind of helps with that process to have an entertainment setting for people coming in town and so mm-hmm. forth. Um, but, uh, so we put the, we were going to put this bar in. So we, we planned everything deliberately along the way. And the, the bar has, uh, a tower with six taps and I've got, you know, at that point we're designing it. We, I had all my home burn stuff down in the basement and mainly for storage and its climate conditions so I can dial in whatever fermentation temperature I want there almost. Um, so I store everything down there, but uh, uh, I also decided, you know, there's just not room to put the beer, you know, uh, in under the cabinets in the bar and uh, have that there. So what I did is I built a keyser, a standard keyser, you know, with a collar on it, and it's big enough to hold six corny kegs in it and the CO2. So that is down in the basement. And I have a trunk line. It has uh, six beverage lines and two glycol lines that go from there up the wall of the basement, across the joist underneath, and come up into the cabinet under the bar and then connects to the tower and it, like as I said, it's an outdoor uh, bar as well. So what that led to also because of it being outdoor and the line length being roughly 20 feet, most of it inside but still inside is in the typically in the 60s, is that's, that, that's pretty good line length. So it's driving me closer to a commercial uh, dispensing system than a typical home type. Mm -hmm. So what that drove me to is needing to put in a glycol system to keep it cool because, you know, I had, I had the keys are set up before the, uh, the glycol was in. So what you would have happen is you go out there and you pour beer, particularly, particularly in the summer, uh, you pour beer, you go back and when you pour it, you're bleeding off a lot of foam because the lines each of the lines has almost half a beer that it holds between the keyser and the tap. So you're, you're foaming out almost half a beer each time. And, but if you go back 10 minutes later, it's back to foam again. So what the glycol does is it keeps that line cold, keeps the CO2 in solution. And so I'm not losing uh, except on the four, first pour, and then if you go back out again, it's it's all normal, just like you'd have like in a restaurant. So that drove me. That's how building a pool drives you to a glycol system. <laughs> They're connected. 
<laughs> so the so uh, I guess just to just to start at the at the at the bottom of uh, knowledge here, you would th- one would think if you didn't know anything about uh, uh, physics and mechanics and all that stuff that you just uh, carbonate a beer and you run it through a tube and it comes out the other side, you know, all happy. But but what what are the dynamics there? What happens? Why do you have to have, uh, you know, tubes of certain diameter for certain lengths and certain pressure and all that? What's going on there? Well, you mentioned the, the, the three components. You start with beer in a keg. That beer, according to the style of the beer, is typically going to be held at a pressure of around 10 to 15 uh, PSI, pounds per square inch. Don't ask me what that is in millibars or anything <laughs> metric. Um, so I know you like to. Uh, I try. Convert. You try. <laughs> we we can handle temperature. <laughs> there you go. Um, but it's going to be held at about ten to fifteen psi in that keg, and we'll talk about that again in a, in a second. But uh, between, and you can tweak that a little bit because you can tweak the pressure and the. Uh, uh, in the temperature. So you've got that held there and then you have the line that's in between it and the tap. Um, and then you have the tap. So when we go back to the liquid, it's going to be at, uh, typically 10 to 15 PSI, depending on the style. There are charts out there. They're out there online that will show you the amount of carbonation, uh, that you want to have for different styles of beer. So if you're doing like a British style, like a stout or an, a bitter ESB, those will be lower in carbonation. And for carbonation, what is commonly referred to are volumes of CO2. So if we talk about the different styles, the, the, the lower ones being the stouts and ESBs, and they'll be around about one and a half to low twos in terms of volumes. And what a volume means is if it's a, if you have two volumes of CO2 in a beer, that means that if you can think of three kegs sitting side by side, one is full of beer, and then the other two are full of CO2, you're going to take that volume of CO2 and those other two kegs and put it in the keg with the beer. Hmm. Um, so there, the other styles, you know, like the lagers and ales will typically be in the mid twos. I shoot for about two and a half. And then some of the uh, Belgian styles like wheat and lambics, they'll be up at upper twos all the way up to four. Um, so generally above four is, is regarded as overcarbonated. Under one and a half roughly is uh, undercarbonated. So when you look at these charts, there are charts that will show you, you know, temperature versus pressure and what for a given amount of CO2 and a range of temperatures, what range of pressures go with that? Because the colder the beer, the more CO2 it can hold. So I'm looking at a chart right now, and if I wanted to have two and a half uh, volumes of beer at let's say 36 degrees, then that would mean a pressure of 10 psi applied to that keg. Um, so that you like I said, you can vary it a little bit. So so that's the liquid part. Um, in between that and the tap is the line. Now when you when you get to the tap. What you want to have is a pressure coming out that tap, the ending pressure to be about one PSI. And that'll get you about, a a typical flow rate is about two ounces per second. So, you know, you'd fill a pint glass in eight seconds. So you're, you're held to do to that in order to not over pour, not over carb by velocity to keeping it around one PSI at the end. But this last example I gave you, the, you know, it was 10 PSI, that temperature, in the keg. So you've got to drop it between the keg and the tap. And the way you drop it is by properly choosing your line size and length. 
and the and the temperature and and if you're uh, if you're having a long uh, line like you've got, where yeah. does where does temperature come in there into the equation? Well, um, for my case, it was uh, I've got I, I wanted to size the line as close as possible because it is a trunk line. I mean this this was not a cheap line that I had to buy because it comes with uh, you know six beverage lines and the glycol lines and the, the aluminum foil and insulation around it to keep it, uh, to, to keep it constant or uh, constant temperature. So, uh, I wanted to get that right. And you, what you want to do is get that as close as possible because beyond that, you've got a couple other things you can do to, to tune it in to where it's working right for you. And, uh, in my case, I, I got the the line size, which is mine, and mine is uh, twenty feet in length, and I have a five sixteenths line. Now, when you talk about the line, there are different. Uh, there's there's amount of, there's resistance in the line that drops the pressure between the keg and the tab, and it varies. It varies amongst the size of the line, the diameter of the inside diameter of the line, and the length. So if you, if you look at a typical kegerator that you buy, most of those will come with three sixteenths inside diameter line. It'll be a beverage grade vinyl, mm -hmm. and that type right there has uh, a pressure loss of three uh, psi per foot. So if you are uh, in that example, if you're using a 10 psi pressure, and you're losing, let's say over, let's say the line is three feet long, then you're going to lose three times three psi. That's three psi per foot. So you'll lose nine psi along the way, and that'll leave you one psi at the end. Now there will be some miscellaneous losses in between as well. If you've got any elbows or fittings that may cause a pressure drop across them that will have to be accounted for as well. But those are usually pretty minor. So, but if you take that 3 sixteenths, that would work in that case. And if it's not quite enough pressure, you can always increase your pressure some and you may need to decrease, or I'm sorry, you could increase the pressure and you could increase the temperature uh, to try to stay at that same volume level, CO2 volume level uh, for the right level carbonation of the beer. Because but, because fluid at a higher temperature holds less CO two, right, right. So, but if you're like so many of your listeners may be doing, they may be building their own kegerator or their own keyser, and if they happen to um, choose, say, a quarter inch tubing instead of three sixteenths, very close together, but for the regular vinyl lines, that. Uh, let me see, a quarter inch uh, versus three sixteenths. Three sixteenths loses three PSI per foot. Uh, you go to quarter inch, it goes to 0.85 PSI per foot. So that's a big difference. Hmm. That would increase the uh, flow out of the tap tremendously because you've got six PSI more in that quarter inch line than you do in the three sixteenths inch line of just over a three foot section. Hmm. Um, and the other thing is different brands have, uh, different resistances. Like the, the brand I bought is not the same as the beverage grade vinyl lines. So you've got to look at the manufacturer and look at what they rate their resistance at. So, uh, there's also, you know, uh, brands, there's types, there's also, you know, a popular type now are these, uh, I think it's silver ion lines that are really good at an being antimicrobial, and they have different properties as well. So you've got to look at that because you've got to get that resistance right in between and drop that PSI the right amount. And to do so, you've got to be able to try to predict it as well as you can ahead of time. Now, if we're not engineers, <laughs> yeah, yeah. where do we go or how do we figure this stuff out? I mean, what what are the tips that you can give us uh, to kind of uh, give us some ammunition in 
uh, trying to, to design our own systems? Well, first of all, is know your products. Know the know the uh, the range you're going to be uh, pressurizing it at. And like I said, that's going to run 10 to 15, but, you know, there's others. If you get into higher volumes, you could be up in the 20 PSI pressure range. But uh, you want to know your products first so you know the properties of them. But there are some uh, online calculators that will do this for you. You just have to know the properties you're dealing with. Um, and really the only property to know is, you know, is, is of the line you're going to choose. Uh, so they'll have different types, different amounts of resistance depending on the type of line and the diameter of line. Uh, once you choose uh, that line, then you would uh, be able to vary the length of it in order to adjust that total pressure drop between the tank and the tap so that you can and you can always start long and shorten it up along the way too is it be, i would assume that it would be better i mean is that where if you're having problems with too little pressure or too much pressure is that where you would start adjusting uh, my instinct would be to change the pressure on the keg but if you change the pressure on the keg you're going to be changing the amount uh, that your your beer is carbonated right oh absolutely and that's the first mistake made and and, and i've made it um back in the kegerator days and that is where you're not getting the right flow rate coming out and i had a kind of iffy uh regulator that wasn't displaying very well and i'd go turn it up well a couple weeks later i've got over carbonated beer mm -hmm. and to uncar Un, or to drop the carbonation in beer is, is is not as easy as taking it up, certainly, if you want to try to drop it. Uh, I want to talk about your glycol system because you said yeah. that uh, you, you put this in yourself. Yeah, yeah. If You, you can go out and buy a uh, glycol system. Um, for the size that I have, you know, it'd be well over $1,000. And the one I ended up putting in, I ran the numbers on it. It was in the... Uh, and it cost me in the low 400s, I would say. So, you know, significant savings. And I can adjust parts of it instead of just buying this package. So if we go back to what uh, where my keyser is, sitting down in the basement, I've got six beverage lines coming out of it, you know, and six corny cakes sitting in it. And that uh, freezer is a, I think it's a 10 cubic foot freezer. Well, I went and bought another freezer. It was the smallest one that I could get, and it's, it's about five, or the smallest adequate one. It's, I think, a five-cubic-foot freezer, and it sits right next to it. So think about this trunk line. I have this trunk line that's coming top down from the above, coming down along the joist, and then coming down the back wall. Well, coming down the wall, it splits. So I have six beverage lines going to the keyser, and I have the two glycol lines that go to the uh, glycol freezer. And they come into the bottom of that uh, freezer. And if you look inside of a freezer, you'll see where you've got a little hump. Mm -hmm. You know, chest freezers have a little hump, and that's where the compressor sits. So I had this well next to it that I said, well, that'll make a good place for uh, glycol. And I measured it, and it turned out to be about eight gallons. So I built a uh, PVC frame that would fit in there, and it makes it comes right up to the level of the hump, so that I have a uh, plexiglass uh, rectangle sitting on top of the frame and the hump to separate it. So I poured the glycol down in that bottom, and this works best because you know it's got a the inside of the keyser has a foil uh, lining that conducts heat better than uh, like the older ones did. So my, my glycol is making contact with that. And I have two the two lines come into that, go through the plexiglass and go into the reservoir in the well. Then I have a temperature probe that comes in to there as well because you do need to have a temperature control on a glycol freezer because a typical freezer will go down too low than what you need. So I have my my freezer set on 26 degrees right now, and that thing works like a champ. It I turn it on, and I've got the switch right right at the bar, so I can turn it on from upstairs. 
I turn it on and it'll maintain, even in the summer, it'll maintain a 29 degree line temperature, hmm. um, which is great. So I've got the size right and the flow right and uh, it all working well. But those lines, uh, there's a there's a blue line and a red line. The blue line is the outgoing that's carrying the cold glycol out. It comes out of the freezer, out of the back, and goes to a pump. And that pump I chose was a, uh, it was like a, a, a big aquarium pump. And when you pick a pump, you want to make sure you've got one that can overcome any elevation differences in between. Um, and in my case, I do have elevation differences. So, And that plays into, that's something we didn't talk about, is the fact that elevation has to be taken into account, too, on your pressure of your beer because of having to drive that up. Um, now, could you that, could you use a pump like uh, they use for for water in an RV, something like that? Is there what pumps have is what they call a, a head rating, and it's basically how high of a column of water it can pump. And in my case, I'm going up about ten feet, and I have one that can handle, I think, t- up to twenty feet. Um, so it. It has to be able to pump up, although it falls back down, but to prime it, you've got to be able to pump up at least for the height difference in there. So anyway, I have this pump that sits between the two freezers. So the glycol comes out of the glycol freezer, goes into the pump, and it goes and joins the trunk line, goes up through the line, goes around the tower. The tower you know, is built for that, and most commercial ones are. And then comes back down and empties back into this reservoir of glycol. Hmm. And so it's constantly being cooled. It is circulating around. It is keeping the beer cool because if you don't keep it cool, CO2 will come out of solution um, unless you're just constantly pouring. And you'll have foamy beer. That's interesting. I I would have thought that... The vessel that would hold I, – I didn't think that you could just pour glycol into a, you know, into a, a well like that. I would, I would have thought that uh, the glycol would have had to been under pressure in an enclosed system kind of like a Freon or something like that. Well, no. It's just a uh, – mine's an open uh, container. The main thing is you want it to have exposure to the uh, freezer so that it can re – cool it each time because as it goes up and comes back down it's picking up that heat Mm -hmm. um so theoretically there's a few degrees difference between the outgoing and incoming and i've got enough contact area with it sitting in the bottom of that freezer for it to uh recharge and be able to go on like i said it it's holding at 29 degrees and that is ideal when i first started this um, I didn't have a temperature control on it, and we would have it freezing the beer some um, because it was just too cold um, initially, at least initially. Then it, it settles out after a while. So I got a temperature control, put it on, and like I said, I've got mine it's set at 26. And, you know, for any given system, you've got to tweak it depending on the conditions you're in. So we, uh, I, I solicited questions from uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook, and I want to get to at least some of those. Um, the first one here is a, is a more general one from uh, Calderia Con Queso <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, he says, line length and foaming. I've never understood that one. So I guess you gave us the basics. Uh, so the, the, you have to have the, the proper line length for the proper diameter and the proper pressure, right? Right, right. You know, you're constrained at both ends because you can, you know, you want the one PSI coming out the tap, but on the uh, keg side, you've got a little bit of room to play with to adjust, but most of where you want to get it right is is right there in the middle, and that's with that line. Uh, so anytime, you know, even for a uh, keyser or kegerator, if, if, if it's a home build, is just make sure you're getting the right length of line. And, it, and for those short of links, if you're just going to a uh, shank coming out of a keyser or coming up to a tower on a kegerator, you know, you're going to be in that three to four foot range of line length. And that three sixteenths is uh, uh, vinyl is, is good for that. But I know people have used other brands, the more or less the antimicrobial types. 
that have different properties. So you've got to look at those values first to get your line lengths uh, right and overcome overcome that resistance. Citizen Kale says, uh, what's the right way to force carbonate uh, the, or benefits slash cons of? So, uh, uh, you know, the, there's there's two strategies, I guess, to carbonating a beer. There's the sort of natural carbonation where you, you just set it at the uh, the serving pressure and let nature take its course over time. And then there's the other way where you crank up the pressure and, uh, you know, for a short period of time, and then uh, release that pressure, and then serve it at a at a lower pressure. What's your preference? Well, mine is to uh, start off with the agitation, and I do it by agitation by taking it to thirty psi, and then I, I've got a long in my keyser. I've got dual manifolds, you know, for the six beer uh, lines, and then I have uh, an extra one that I have a uh, like a. 15 foot hose that comes out so I can crank up I can shut off the beer lines crank up the the pressure to 30 psi pull that line out hook it to a keg put it on the floor and I, I usually just roll mine and I'll roll it you know vigorously for about a minute and a half to two minutes depending on the style but what I what you, what you have to be careful is not do too much I'm trying to get mine to where I can creep up to a level, and then go to serving pressure, and within a couple of days, I'm okay. Because uh, I don't want to overcarbonate. If you overcarbonate, then there's a couple of methods to back it back down. But um, I like to come up from the bottom and then just let that serving pressure get at the rest of the 20% or whatever mm-hmm. to where I want to be. Uh, Timberati says, to burp or not to burp kegs when carbonating? I guess if you are... Uh, going that approach and doing a 30 psi initial charge of CO2, you gotta uh, you gotta release that pressure uh, from the keg to, before you put it on the lower uh, serving pressure, right? Yeah, yeah. You want to make sure you you're not still up above uh, that serving pressure, so you don't backfeed into your reg- some liquid into your regulator, and then that'll foul it up. Uh, Evs, I'm going to say, says, can you still use corny kegs without a kegerator or any form of chilling equipment? Well, you know, I have a party tap. Um, you can buy these uh, ones that have the little CO2 cartridges to go on the uh, the uh, CO2 uh, uh, pen lock or ball lock. Mm-hmm. And then a party tap out the other end. So you don't have to have a keg rate. If you can just keep the keg cold and then uh, take it to your favorite ball game, I guess. But you but you got to have a if, – if you're going to have a kegging system, you're, you're going to have some sort sort of refrigeration. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Because you got to get that beer down cold enough to where it will accept the CO2 and – and uh, you got to maintain the proper temperature and the proper pressure and all that. And you, if you're going to get into kegging, you've got to bite the bullet in some way, whether it's to buy a smaller keg that will fit into your refrigerator uh, or, you know, you've got to have some sort of uh, uh, chilling equipment, I, I'm, I'm afraid. Right. <laughs> right. Kind of the price of admission. Our buddy Craig Hendry from down in Mississippi says, uh, is icing a warm keg overkill when serving through a jockey box? Uh, with an ice plate or coil chillers, or do we trust the chiller to do the job? So a jockey box, for those that don't know, is a, a picnic cooler with um, uh, with uh, some sort of chilling device inside that you run the beer through, and it has taps on it. Uh, do you Would you set your keg uh, just uh, out on the ground, you know, unchilled, or, or do you want to, like, put your, put your keg in, a, in a, some ice or something? I don't have a jockey box, but I would want to keep my keg, my beer, my prized possession at a constant temperature. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder if, uh, I guess Craig's question is, uh, you know, do you think that chiller inside the jockey box would, uh, oh, you know, would do that would do the work of chilling the beer down enough? I guess I've it depends heard... on your system, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh uh, Drotty says, foamy pour, colon, overcarbonated beer or unbalanced dispensing system. Could could be a little both. Yeah, well, like I said before, you know, I've done this before where you go and uh, you, you don't have the, the volume coming out and you turn up the pressure and you're not realizing 
if you're going too high for your style and you can end up being in that overcarbed range, which is, you know, from the charts over four volumes. And uh, then you, you've got some work to get it back down. Bill on Twitter says uh, the advantages of taps with built-in flow regulators. We didn't talk about uh, that at all, the taps. Yeah, that's an advantage. If you can't get your line size right, that that's a, a good catch-all right there. And it's also very good for adjusting to the different styles of beer because if you if you set up your line for, you know, the middle of the road, say two and a half volumes, which is like an IPA, pale ale, lager, and – you want to have, uh, say, uh, say an ESB it that's going to be have lower volumes, then you may not have enough pressure to to bring it out um, because of the line length and the resistance in between. So those devices are uh, very very versatile in the fact that you can res- do your restriction instead of doing all your restriction with the line and figuring that is have that as your tap so you can pour the tap and the ones I've seen have a knob on it that you can adjust the flow restriction down and be able to be more versatile with the styles of beer you want to use. Uh, Andrew on uh, Facebook has a, has a good thinker. What is essential equipment to start out with so that you don't make a lot of upgrade purchases in a short period of time? I, you know, I could have built built the bar to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I still have my kegerator, which is a great item to have. Um, you know, what we've talked about, I, you know, there are so many people that have either kegerators or keysers that they've built. Um, I hope the point gets carried across to pay attention to the line type and length for those, for the home-built ones. Um, but for anybody that is taking something out of the kegerator and going external to it, uh, they'll be in a situation like I was. And, you know, one thing I did not mention before well is the fact that, you know, for my system, it applies a little bit to a kegerator, but you do have an elevation rise with the kegerator of about two feet, and that amounts to about an additional one PSI lost along the way that helps. In my case, I was going up about 10 feet and losing about five PSI along the way. Um, but if anybody, you know, is, is, is doing this in the future that would be going from a keyser instead of just going out with shanks and a tap and going somewhere else, they'll need to pay attention to these lines very closely. Now, one thing that, uh, uh, I haven't talked about, I don't think, is I got a kegerator with a column on top with two taps and, uh, I hooked up my corny kegs, uh, to those taps and I discovered that if I didn't have a beer, uh, you know, in a, in a day or two, that the beer in the lines up in that column, you know, became warm. Right. And then and then the uh, the taps actually became sticky. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, I actually, you know, I, I had the cheap handles that came with the taps initially on there. And I wound up actually breaking one of those plastic handles off because the 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 tap uh the tap got stuck with the right. with the warm old beer right right and it is probably right at that ball valve that's uh uh holding the beer back more but you know i saw something interesting the other day where somebody had fashioned some copper pipes with uh water in them so they had, you know sealed them at each end and they were uh, so there were several of them and he had mounted them up in the tower and they extended into the, the the refrigerated compartment such that they would conduct heat and in, in this case basically uh, cool the tower better hmm. than just that little standard little bit of foam insulation that's up in there and that's that's a technique to to look at as well yeah that's interesting because because cold does not go up. <laughs> right, right. And even if it's insulated, it's only going to be insulated to room temperature, essentially, uh, because it's yeah, sticking up yeah. above the refrigerator. Let, well, either that or you just continuously keep drinking. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, you're doing it for a reason. You're keeping the lines cool. That's right. So you can Doctor. Tell your wife that. <laughs> Doctor, I got to do it. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, my my solution was that I just said to heck with it, and I put uh, picnic taps onto the kegs, uh, and then you know whenever I want a beer, I just open the door, and yeah, so yeah. you know the 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 taps. Uh, the cheap taps stay in there uh, along with, the, you know, the, with the line in the refrigerator. Uh, they're always at serving temperature. And, uh, you know, it's it's less convenient uh, not to just walk up and, and, and get the thing, uh, get the beer out of the taps. Uh, the good news is that, you know, if I'm having a party or something like that, you know, I could I could reattach those taps uh, yeah. on the top. Uh, are you on call uh, for for questions uh, through email on, on people in their foamy beers? Oh, sure, sure. Just uh, shoot away because, you know, I've got an educational background that helps me understand this a little better, but it's still, I mean, it's still a learning process and a lot of tweaking and experimenting along the way to get to where, where mine's functioning well now. But the, but the rewards to your patients are worth it. They're immense. <laughs> Well, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate your uh, appreciate the conversation. I appreciate your expertise. Thanks, Phil. You're welcome. And I want to say thank you again for what you do. I just I got to tell you that uh, I was driving this morning and I was listening to your latest podcast, and I'm thinking, where else can I learn about brewing a mushroom beer? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what occurred to me is that uh, uh, right now I have a keg cold crashing, which is what I use my, my keg rater for now, a keg of chili beer, mm-hmm. cold crashing, and I'm kegging it tonight, um, but it is a uh, Serrano pepper with Carolina Reaper peppers. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah, that uh, I'll be kegging. So after I heard the mushroom episode, I said, you know, I need to see how tomatoes work uh, <laughs> because I put these three together, I could do a pizza beer now. <laughs> Yeah, we're going in all kinds of directions. And that, so anyway, thank you for uh, and that is a future these unique topics to us. <laughs> all right, thanks, Phil. You're welcome. Well, thanks again to Phil, and thanks to everybody for your questions. I would have I would have addressed more questions, but my trusty eight year old laptop that I recorded hundreds of episodes with died abruptly. Afraid it was something on the uh, the motherboard, and I had to uh, switch to a second machine uh, and pick up where we left off and, and wrap up that conversation fairly quickly. So, rest in peace, 2007 vintage MacBook Pro, and I hope that the uh, the new laptop lasts at least as long. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to James at basicbrewing.com. Or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. You can check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. You can get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. If there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Obi-Wan Kenobi Costume Standard, Chest Size 40 to 44, and Char Crust Dry Rub Seasoning for Meat and Fish sun-dried tomato and garlic. There is also a whole bunch of not-safe-for-work stuff on there, too. Woo! Have fun, everybody. Uh, <laughs> thanks again. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. And don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. And don't, and don't forget that uh, the AHA uh, will give you free yeast if you join a Renew before October 31st. So there you go. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Thank you.